Uh, as we get started into our, uh, into our message this morning, I wanted to show you a brief video clip. There's a, a great TED Talk. I love TED Talks. If you uh, aren't familiar, there are these, there, you can find them on YouTube or on the TED Talk website. They're usually like 15 to 20 minute um, Talks given by experts in specific fields, and often they, you know, talk about really interesting things like, you know, uh, super fast cameras that can actually take a picture of a laser going through a Coke bottle. Um, there's lots of uh, great. Uh, Brene Brown has a really great one if you're interested in her TED talk, and I and I came across this one actually. A couple of years, years ago, I've used it multiple times in sermon illustrations uh, because even though Shay isn't necessarily talking about the Bible or about spirituality, his understanding of what good art does translates so well into what good discipleship looks like. And Shay Hembry is this uh, artist, and if you wanted to find the whole um, thing on YouTube, it's about 16 minutes long. It's called How I Became 100 Artists by Shay Hembry. Shay is a contemporary artist in the United States. Uh, he grew up in like rural southern Arkansas and you'll hear it. I'm going to show a little clip. You'll hear his accent. Uh, he grew up in one of those places that would be the least likely to become a contemporary artist. Uh, he remembers his dad uh, shooting flies off the wall with a BB gun in his living room. Uh, his dad knew exactly how much to pump up the BB gun to not damage the wallpaper behind the wall. Uh, he and his sister had competitions about who could eat the most squirrel brains. Um, <laughs> Shay, probably not the guy you would pick to be, a, you know, living in New York and uh, becoming a, a highfalutin artist. But Shay looked at the world of contemporary art and he was frustrated with how inaccessible it was. And I don't know uh, how much you look at contemporary art, but a lot of times when I see stuff like a Jackson Pollock, I'm like, uh, like I could splatter paint that. Like, why is that worth $5 million? Like, um, I, I, I don't always get, I don't stand at a painting and be like, I'm not sure I understand the use of mauve in this particular. What emotion is it trying to? Like, I don't own a turtleneck. Um, so, so, and Shay had some of those similar frustrations with the world of contemporary art. He said it's so inaccessible for the average person. It seems to be made for a very specific people. And he he'd traveled around the world and he said, I, I want to create a, a, an art show. I want to create a show that's accessible to everybody. And that my art that is going to be in here would pass what he calls his memos test. And he says, if I can't explain a work of art in five minutes to my grandmother in southern Arkansas, then it's not worth showing. She should be able to understand. It should be able to evoke some sort of stuff from here, from her. And so it had, that was one of the criteria. And the other one was it would have head, heart, and hands. And that's the, the message that I've uh, preached a few times, head, heart, and hands. And so he decided he was going to find a hundred artists that would meet those requirements, that their art would pass Memo's test and would have head, heart, and hands. And as he started to figure out who around the world would be able to fit into that, he realized this is going to be a lot of work to try and do. And it would just be easier if he invented 100 artists. So that's what Shea did. Instead of going and finding 100 artists, he created out of his own imagination 100 individual people all of their backstory. He created their art in various different mediums. And then he put on an art show with 100 artists where he was actually the only one who had done any of the work in the art gallery. And so one of them is going to be the intro to our message this morning. And it is, the whole thing is worth the 16 minutes of your time. But one of them, he talks about this, uh, uh, this idea of a dig jig. So this is a brief clip from the actual talk. Shea Hembry. Uh, this is by a duo, Micah Abernathy and Bud Holland, and they're interested in creating culture, just traditions. So what they do is they move into an area and try to establish a new tradition in a small geographic area. So this is in eastern Tennessee, and what they decided was that, you know, we need a positive uh, tradition that goes with death. So they came up with dig jigs, and a dig jig... <laughs> A dig jig is where, uh, for a milestone anniversary or birthday, you, um, you get all your friends and family together and you dance on where you're going to be buried. And um, we, we got a lot of attention when we did. 
This is, I talked my family into doing this at home. They didn't know what I was doing. And I was like, get dressed for a funeral. We're going to go do some work. And so we got to the graveyard and, and made this, which was hilarious, um, the attention that we got. So what happens is you dance on the grave. And then after you, you've done your dance, uh, everyone toasts you and tells you how great you are. And you, in essence, have a funeral that you get to be present for. That's my mom and dad. So he had this idea for a dig jig to create this artist, and then he created the names of the artists, the Abernathys, who was actually him. And then he got all his family together, got them dressed up, they went to a cemetery, and they took photos of themselves dancing around in the cemetery. You can imagine what that would have uh, caused quite an uproar in the neighborhood. But I love this idea of the dig jig, this idea of having a party uh, in the place where you're going to be buried, where you actually get to hear what people would say about you at your funeral. Have you ever wondered what your funeral would look like. Maybe you're not as morbid as I am, but I've often wondered, like, if I passed away, whose lives, would it be enough that they'd take some time off of work to come and say goodbye to me? Um, <laughs> is, that, is that not good, Sarah? Like, it's, it's a little harsh. I, would so. I know you would. I know you would. Um, <laughs> But to, to wonder, like, how, what kind of impact have I had in people's lives? What would they say at my funeral? Because I've been to some funerals where the talk that is shared from the front doesn't match up with the person that I know is about to be buried. Where we talk all these nice flowery things, we talk about all the great things, and in reality, the person wasn't all that nice. I've also been to some funerals where it seems like nobody liked this guy who is being put in the ground. What if you had a dig jig, though? What if you had a party where you got together and people actually said the things that they would say basically at your funeral, the, a funeral that you'd be present for? Maybe it's a bit of a morbid thought, but it's something that is good for us to engage in. What kind of impact are we making in the world around us? How are you affecting the people that you are closest to? And then as those circles expand, what sort of impact are you having? If we borrow Jesus' words... The picture here is, what kind of fruit are you bearing? A fruit that lasts or a fruit that quickly passes away? This morning we're continuing our series, In the Vine. Last couple of weeks we've talked about getting connected, we've talked about being formed, and this morning we're going to talk about reaching out. And we've been looking at some of the words of Jesus that we find in the Gospel of John. John, uh, one of his beloved disciples, one of the inner twelve, actually probably one of the inner three that were closest to Jesus, he records these stories of Jesus' life, these exploits, we hear about his miracles, we hear about some of his teaching, and the reason why John records all of this stuff is in the hopes that we might believe that Jesus was the Son of God. He records all of the stories about this amazing man that he walked with for three years in the hopes that we too would come to the conclusion, this is the Messiah. This is the one who is worth giving your life to. And so we've been looking at the first eight verses of chapter 15 in John's gospel, and we're going to be heading back there at least one more time this morning. If you have a Bible, you can turn there, John 15, verses 1 through 8. If you don't have a Bible, I'd love to give you one this morning. We have a stack of them back in the sound booth area that you can pick up on your way home. Um, this word is something you need to get inside of you. It is something that uh, needs to uh, be planted in your heart in order for it to bear fruit. It's something that you need to read as it reads you. It's, I find that God most often changes me through circumstances and through his word. Uh, so it's either if I heed his word and I pay attention to what God's saying to me, maybe some of those circumstances don't need to come in to play. But God often speaks through those two things to lead and direct my life. And so you need to, you need to have a, a Bible. And if, if the Bible back there doesn't work for you, if you don't have one of those, if the beauty of print and parchment doesn't, if it attracts you not, um, Perhaps downloading a Bible app is where the speed that you're at. You'd rather have something on your smart device, something that could set up a reading schedule for you that would give you a verse of the day. Um, they're available in every app store, on every uh, handheld device, and they're totally free. So what I'm basically saying is if you don't have a Bible, I am removing every possible excuse for you to not have a Bible, and we will get one into your hands. If you don't have one right now, though, screens will have the passage we're looking at today. And for those of you who've been here for the last few weeks, we've looked at it from a couple of different translations. We did the NIV, which I most commonly study in the first week. Last week, we looked at the voice, and I'm taking a cue from my good buddy Dave. And we're going to look at the Amplified Bible this morning. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that continues to bear fruit, he repeatedly prunes 
so that it will bear more fruit, even richer and finer fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have given you, the teachings which I have discussed with you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself without remaining in the vine, remember, you can bear, you, neither can you bear fruit, producing evidence of your faith unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For otherwise, apart from me, that is, cut off from the vital union with me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out like a broken off branch and withers and dies. And they gather such branches and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is, if we are vitally united and my message lives in your heart, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified and honored by this when you bear much fruit and prove yourselves to be my true disciples. So far for now. It's helpful to remember the context of these words. Jesus is sharing these kind of as his last words to his disciples. Um, Depending on where in the discourse it happens, he is either still gathered around the table with his disciples. He has been teaching them uh, throughout the evening as they've gathered for what's commonly called the Last Supper. They're reclined at the table. You'll hear phrases like, uh, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He, he picks up the basin and the towel and he washes his disciples' feet. He shares this passage about remaining in him and whether he's still reclined at the table or they're already on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, whether he's actually walking through a vineyard when he shares. These are some of the final words that Jesus has for the twelve. By dusk the following day, Jesus would be stretched out on a cross. He would be giving his life for each one of us. If you knew that, and if they knew that these were his last words, how closely would they want to lean in and hear what Jesus was teaching? I believe that this is the crux of what Jesus was after when he was introducing the kingdom of God to his disciples. This is the essence of what he was inviting them to, that he was inviting them to remain in him, to stay connected to the vine, and that they would bear much fruit. For that's his call. Stay connected to allow the Father to prune us that we might bear much fruit. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about remaining in the vine. We, we, we used the words getting connected, get connected to the vine. And last week, we talked about how the Father prunes us, repeatedly prunes us, is the way the Amplified puts it, or forms us, that we need to be formed. Uh, here at Grace Community, we're engaging in our discipleship journey around those three phrases for the next little while. That we want to be connected, we want to be formed, and we want to reach out. And so this morning, we're going to look at the last of these. This idea of bearing fruit, of reaching out. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. We talked about it in the first message about what this fruit looks like in our lives. And uh, we went first to look at the fruit of the Spirit, the, probably the most natural place for us to look. Paul's letter to the Galatians, he writes in chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, he said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. I memorized it as patience, but forbearance. Uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Paul is saying that this is the, the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, when the Spirit is on you, when the Spirit is alive in you, when you're walking in the way of Jesus, this is the fruit that should be produced in your life. This is the result of remaining in the vine. If you're connected with God, the fruit of that is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The longer we walk with Jesus, the more love we should have in our lives, the more joy we should experience, the more peace we should recognize, the more patience. This is a dangerous thing to pray for, to ask God to teach you patience because he likely will insert somebody in your life that will help you learn patience. But the longer we walk with Jesus, the more that should be evidenced in our lives. 
But this isn't the only fruit that Jesus is talking about. He's not just talking about our own personal character, um, that that's the only thing that should be influenced by our walk with Jesus. Being connected to the vine and formed by the Father should cause us to invest in other people. It should cause us to want to share this good news that we've been given. It should compel us to serve and to love and to reach out. The fruit that we bear is the life of Jesus flowing into, but also through us. You see, the vine that we're connected to is what produces the life. It's where the freedom comes. It's where the power is. It's where, it's where we find life in the vine. But it's the branch that bears fruit. It's the ba- branch that produces fruit. We need to be connected to the vine, but there needs to be more than just the enjoying the sunshine and being connected to the life flow of Jesus. Paul uses different language uh, when he talks about the life of Christ being lived in us. Um, He he said the goal of our connection with Jesus is that he might be more clearly represented in the world and uh, to, to reveal the love of Jesus that doesn't often get seen or the character of God that sometimes gets marred by what goes on in the world around us. He puts it this way in Galatians 2. He says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's not the life that I live anymore. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't know if you think of your life in that particular light. I don't know if you think of yourself as no longer alive to your own desires and your own will, but that you have surrendered that to Jesus. It's no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. It's his life that we want revealed to the world around us. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. That's what it looks like to be connected to the vine. Christ in us. Christ alive in us. Uh, Paul wrote a number of letters to different churches. So the Galatians was to the church in Galatia, to the church in Coloss. We find the book of Colossians. He writes something similar. In chapter 2 he says, So then just as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. That our life and his life life should be meshed together. Sometimes I feel like we've made it our life and Jesus' life over here and we just say, Jesus, could you come over here and bless what I'm doing here? Could you, could you, I want to do this over here where our life and his life need to be meshed together. Jesus is not just an additive that we bring in once a week when we gather for a Sunday morning. His life is meant to be lived in and through us. The Spirit of God is alive in us. If we have accepted Jesus, if we have invited him into our lives, if we've surrendered ourselves to him, his life now lives in us. The Spirit of God has awakened that part of us that is in communion with the Father. And so the life of God is in us, and that life should bear fruit. So Jesus says, I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser, and he prunes that fruit so that it will bear much fruit. We're called to bear fruit, to reach out beyond ourselves. The development of our own character, the development of who we are is, is important, but it doesn't stop with just being a really good person. Because further down in the passage, in verse 16, Jesus mentions that he is sending us out in order that we might bear fruit. John 15, verse 16, he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. As an aside, this is the second time Jesus mentioned this, ask whatever you want and it's going to be given to you. And I've always wrestled with those phrases of Jesus. I've really struggled with this idea of like, he's like this butler in the sky. I love, uh, Dr. Andrew Gabriel was here a few months ago and he mentioned that like, God is not some cosmic bellhop where we like ring the bell and he comes running. And sometimes when I read passages like this, ask whatever you want, it's going to be given to you. I feel like that's what Jesus is saying is like, I can just ask whatever I want. But read in the context of these two passages, if you remain in the vine, if your desire is to bear good fruit, ask for it, it's going to be given to you because it's his desire as well. If your desire is to see him glorified, if your desire is to see him lifted up, go ahead and ask and God will use you. So I don't think it's just a blank check that God's writing so that we can go out and buy the latest Mercedes. I think it might be that he wants us to bear good fruit and if we ask for that, he's going to give it. And it'll be fruit that's going to last. 
Uh, last week after the service, Marcel and I were talking. Marcel and Rita bring all of the vegetables uh, every Sunday for us to enjoy. So for many of us who eat spaghetti squash like twice a year, that's the reason why we eat spaghetti squash twice a year because it's back there at the back. Uh, I had what was Tara made butternut squash loaf uh, in the office this week. It was amazing. Um, But Marcel and I were talking a little bit about this idea of pruning and how the Father prunes us and how he prunes each one of us differently. That uh, different trees require different treatment when it comes to pruning. So you may come across, say, like an apple tree that's got tons of apples growing off of it, but they're growing really close together and the fruit is really small. He said if you, if you have a situation like that, you trim away some of those branches, even though they've got fruit on them, you'll trim away some of those branches so that the light can get in, so that there's less small fruit, but that that fruit has the opportunity to grow, that it's, it's better fruit, it's bigger fruit, and that even though it's a tree that's bearing fruit, the desire of the Father is always that the tree would bear even better fruit. Bigger fruit, more fruit, fruit that will last. I don't know how often you think about this, but little stories like the dig jig, thinking about my own funeral, uh, I know that I want Rich Mullins played at it. Having some of those thoughts roll through our mind reminds me that we are in the business of eternity making. And I don't know that we always think that way, because, well, I don't. I get caught up in dealing with stuff like uh, my van got hailed on and now we got to make an auto pack claim and oh, well, what are we going to do with another vehicle? And I think about like, well, it's Emily's birthday today, so we're going to do supper. And like you guys have already got your lunch plans, right? And if you haven't, you're thinking about it right now because I just said the word lunch plans. <laughs> But we get caught up in some of that stuff. We're, we're busy for some of us who are in the stage of life that we're in. You're busy running your kids from one place to the other, whether it's ballet or hockey or, or even just getting them off to school. The monthly bills roll in. Everything costs money and we get swallowed up in dealing with the everyday stuff of life. And yet there's eternal stuff happening around us all the time. And sometimes we miss it. Sometimes in the midst of dealing with all those things, we miss those conversations that we need to have with our loved ones. We miss those conversations that we need to pour into and just take a moment. I just finished reading an incredible book called Present Over Perfect by Sean and Iquist. And I'd encourage you to read it. If it's, it's not a difficult read. It's challenging in that it challenges your presuppositions about what being busy looks like and whether it's actually worth pouring your time and energy into the stuff that you pour your time and energy into. Like Bob Goff. Bob Goff tells you to quit something every single Thursday. Um, <laughs> not necessarily your job um, every single Thursday. But the idea that like, we just need to slow down sometimes. We need to catch our breath and look at what's really going on around us. Like if I pause for a second, do you hear water running? For some of you, that might have been a distraction for a few minutes, but until I paused, you didn't realize that there was water running. That right now, there is uh, rain that is freshening the grass. Farmers maybe won't be all that excited about it if they're still trying to get crops off. But there's stuff going around us all the time that if we've always got our head down and we're just pressing through and we're just surviving from day to day that we miss out on. And we sometimes forget that this is not the end of the story. What we're experiencing right now is not the end of the story. As tragic and scary as it is to think about a two-year-old with cancer, it's still not the end of the story. And I know that's maybe hard to hear, maybe it's hard for us to wrap our minds around, but... This world is not the end of the story. The life that you're living right now is not the end of the story. There is an eternity that awaits each one of us. And I love the picture that C.S. Lewis paints in uh, his book, The Weight of Glory. He writes these words. He says, It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person that you can talk to may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else, a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. 
It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another. All friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. There is eternal stuff happening around us all the time. And we are helping one another to one destination or another. What kind of fruit are you bearing? Because we all bear fruit. The stuff of eternity. It's in our own lives and it's the lives of those that we invest in. So how are you reaching out? How are you bearing fruit? Where do you see the evidence of the Spirit flowing through you? When you think about reaching out, sometimes we think of evangelism as this thing that you have to be gifted for. You have to have, uh, somehow the Spirit of God is going to move on you to, to like have a word for somebody. And that may happen to you. But why don't you start with learning the names of your neighbors? Uh, why don't you start with figuring out what they do for a living? Finding out a little bit of their story. Um... Last night, we celebrated with not only our neighbor, but with a number of our neighbor's friends. The, his 55th birthday, he got a massive, like, gold record of Rush with a whole bunch of pictures. This was after Brenda left, so she didn't get a chance to see the glory that was the massive <laughs> Rush picture. <laughs> you would have laughed out loud. But engage in the world around you. Think about where you're investing. Think about who you're investing in. Scripture says that money is the root of all evil. And sometimes money gets a bad rap as this thing that's like terrible and we should stay away from it. I don't know if that's true. I know that it sometimes gets control over us in ways that we wish it wouldn't. But can I tell you that money isn't good fruit? If you made $600 million next year, what would it gain for you to profit the whole world yet lose your soul? Money isn't good fruit. So if, if that's the thing we chase after, if that's the only thing that we're worried about, we might be missing what God is calling us to invest in. Hanging out with other Christians all the time isn't the point either. It isn't just about us having good fruit so that we all, you know, show each other the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus, in his famous Sermon on the Mount, he didn't necessarily use the fruit language, but the message is the same. He said, let people see your fruit, bear good fruit, or salt in this case. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, trampled underfoot. Sounds a little bit like a branch that doesn't bear fruit. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. They may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do people see the fruit of your relationship with God? Can people tell that you love Jesus? Is your life marked by fruit because you're connected to the vine? Because it's not something you can muster up. It's not something that you can force. You can't make more fruit. You can try. You can make fake fruit. You can make plastic fruit. You can make fruit that kind of looks like it's maybe desiring to eat, but it's not true fruit unless it's born of the Spirit. All you can do is open up your life to the Spirit of God. All you can do is invite God to bear fruit in you. Because the fruit that we make doesn't last. I built Brenda a beautiful little um, deacon's bench not long after we got married. And it was made out of an old pew. It was this really, 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 really pretty thing that I sold on Kijiji a few weeks ago because we have no room for it in our house. And it's kind of getting a little bit run down. It's like, it's not, it's, it was good fruit, but it's not fruit that lasts. She'll get another deacon's bench. I'll make her something else someday. 
But it's not fruit that's going to last. It's, you know what's going to last? The conversations that we've had, the love that we pour into one another, the way that we raise our kids to love Jesus. That stuff makes a difference. That stuff lasts. What are we doing that allows us to engage in things of eternal significance? How sensitive are you to the voice of the Spirit? Are you willing to kind of drop everything at a moment's notice when He speaks to you? Because fruit grows when we're connected to the vine. It's a byproduct of being connected to the vine. If you don't see much fruit in your life, check your connection to the vine. How connected are you to God? Andrew Murray, in his book, The True Vine, a book you could read it as a daily devotional if you want to. There's 31 really, really short chapters, or you could read it in an afternoon. I read it this past week. He says, if you want to bear fruit, see that the inner life is perfectly right, that your relationship to Christ Jesus is clear and close. Begin each day with him in the morning to know in truth that you are abiding in him and he in you. Christ tells us that nothing less will do. It is not your willing and running. It is not by your might or strength, but by my spirit's says the Lord. Meet each new engagement. Undertake every new work with your ears and heart open to the master's voice. He that abideth in me beareth much fruit. You see to the abiding and he will see to the fruit. For he will give it in you and through you. So, are you connected to the vine? Are you bearing good fruit? Are you bearing fruit that will last? Or do you need to get connected? Do you need to be formed? Do you need to be reaching out? Here at Grace, we've got a number of ways that we do that on a regular basis. I mentioned Tuesday, the food bank. You can come and help out, unload a truck, pour into a neighborhood that needs assistance on occasion. If you can't make it on Tuesday, bring food for the bin. Uh, Many of you may not be aware of some of the investments that we make in our neighborhood around us. Uh, This past summer, we found out that the Learning Center at West Grove was not going to receive funding anymore. That the uh, organization, the government organization that was overseeing it, uh, couldn't afford to keep the program running. And we had seen um, students who didn't have their high school equivalency, who were on social assistance, we had seen at least four students go through that school, a very tiny little individual classroom where people work one-on-one with people to help them with the needs that they have. We saw four people go on to post-secondary education, and we saw another three go into just regular work and get off of assistance. So to me, that's not just giving a handout, that's helping people move forward with their lives. People who... I'm going to borrow the words of a friend who lives in West Grove. Nobody wants to live there. Nobody chooses to live in social assisted housing. So if we can help, if we can help move people, if we can give them the tools that they need. So we got behind this West Grove Learning Center as a church, and I've been on a steering committee that is helping keep the funding open. We are actually, we have adopted them as a ministry of Grace Community Church so that we can apply for grants. And we're looking after payroll and all of that stuff to make sure that we still pour into this neighborhood in a way that makes a difference. So we're running a language and literacy program, um, helping people with their math skills and get their uh, grade equivalency and all of that jazz over there. If you'd like to know more about that, how you can invest in it, talk to me after the service. We bus kids in from that neighborhood every Tuesday night. Last Tuesday night, uh, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but we had close to 30 kids um, in our kids ministry and our Route 56 is um, bursting at the seams as well because we're making a difference in the neighborhood. So you can pour into stuff that's happening right here. Or you can pour into stuff that's happening all around the globe. We give to missions every single month. Every month we send thousands of dollars to ministries around the world because we want to invest in the work of the kingdom. In November, I'm going to be taking a team uh, with, to one of those ministries. We're going to go see Rod and Kaya in Estonia. If you want to come, today's the last day to talk to me about possibly coming along. If you can't come, help send us. Send us to Estonia. Or you can mark Estonia trip on an envelope. Or invest Invest in one of the other ministries, one of the other missionaries that we give to. There are places that you can give here at home. There's places in your own backyard. Maybe you want to sponsor a child. Maybe you want to have your neighbors over for dinner. Maybe you want to give away a bunch of money to fund kingdom work. Maybe you want to volunteer your time to make a difference in somebody else's life. To give with no thought of what your return on your investment is going to be. To give solely because it's the kingdom of God. If your faith is boring, you might not be as connected to the vine as you want to be. You might need to be formed. You might need to reach out. 
focus on others. Nothing helps me deal with my own junk than realizing that other people have junk and help them deal with their junk. There's time for introspection. There's time for working on our own stuff. But sometimes our navel gazing needs to take a new focus and learn to help other people. Take the spotlight off ourselves every once in a while. Because these are the final words of Jesus. These are the last bundle of words that he shares with his disciples. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can't do anything. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You didn't choose me. I chose you. God has chosen each one of us and appointed us so that we might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Father, you are the vine dresser. You are the one who prunes us. You are the one who shapes us. You are the one who causes this fruit to be born in our lives. We recognize that uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us has brought us back into relationship with you and that spirit dwells in us. And we pray that as we remain connected to you, that we would bear good fruit. And I pray that when we uh, sense that that connection has been broken, when sin has entered in, when distraction has uh, caused us to turn our hearts away from you and your kingdom, I pray that you call us back, that you would help us to bear good fruit. I pray that each one of us would experience greater love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, gentleness, self-control. I pray that those fruits of the Spirit would be in ever-increasing measure in each one of our lives as we surrender to you. And I pray that that fruit would flow into the lives of our next-door neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, people at school family members who we've been estranged from. I pray that there would be your spirit at work in us in such a way that it draws people to yourself. That there would be fruit that would last for all of eternity. And so, Lord, would you help us to be people who get connected, who are formed by the master gardener, and who reach out and bear good fruit. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Man. So, I had planned this perfect three-part series in the vine and had it all worked out. And then this week was like, except there's one other part in this passage that we haven't touched on yet. And so next week is going to be the director's cut. You're going to get the little extended edition, and we're going to talk about love. How if any of this is done without love, it means nothing. And so next week is going to be all about love. Until then, life is short. And we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel away with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may God's blessing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Take time today to send an email or a text message to let somebody know that you love them. Take time today to just pause and listen to the rain, to slow down and bear good fruit. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next week.